So we are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Aloni. I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is the largest local media company in the New York metro area. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, webinars, websites, podcasts, and events throughout Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Westchester, Long Island, and Philadelphia. And today we are thrilled to bring you the webinar, Your Child's Asthma and Allergies, a chat with the experts. You know, as trees, shrubs, and flowers are starting their annual bloom, it's a sight for sore eyes for sure, but hidden dangers may await your child in the form of allergies and asthma. And today we have an opportunity to talk to the experts about seasonal allergies, allergies in general, and asthma symptoms in children when to make an appointment with a specialist, and I am honored to introduce our esteemed panelists today. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Callie Tsurilakis. She is a director of pediatric pulmonary and asthma at New York Presbyterian Queens and assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Tsirilakis is a lifelong New Yorker who is a board certified in pediatrics and pediatric pulmonary pulmonology. Her expertise includes the full spectrum of pediatric pulmonary conditions with special expertise in asthma, patient education, quality improvement, pulmonary function testing, flexible bron bronchoscopy, and aerodigestive digestive disorders. She works closely with the New York Department of Health Asthma Control Program and is the chairperson of the American Lung Association's Asthma Coalition of New York City. Welcome, Dr. Tsirilakis. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Next, I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Perdita Permal. She is a board-certified allergist and immunologist and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Weill Cornell Medical, an assistant attending pediatrician at New York Presbyterian Comanche Children's Hospital. Having grown up in Queens, New York, she finds it very rewarding to also serve as a director of the Pediatric Allergy Immunology Program housed within the Pediatric Asthma Center at New York Presbyterian Queens, where she also leads asthma allergy clinical research studies across New York Presbyterian campuses. It's an honor to have you both with us today. So let's get started. Um, so when, if my child is diagnosed with asthma by his pediatrician, when should I take my child to a pulmonologist? And should I worry? <laughs> so that's a very good question. So in general, the, the recommendations from the, the national guidelines, um, the, the expert panel that has been, uh, that has been um, put together over the last several years has recommended that pediatricians are able to manage um, intermittent asthma, they are able to diagnose asthma, they are able to manage um, mild asthma. But once a child is really being diagnosed with what we call persistent asthma, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe persistent asthma, it is suggested and recommended that they are seen by a specialist. That could be either a pulmonologist or an allergist, depending on what resources you have available in your uh, region. Um, here in Queens, we have we are lucky enough to have both pulmonologists and an allergist available to us in our in our asthma center, um, and we both do take care of asthma. Um, in New York, uh, in many centers, most of asthma is taken care of by pulmonologists, but in other regions of the country, um, the uh, allergists are the primary caretakers for uh, patients with asthma. So anytime that your child is either diagnosed with that persistent asthma, anytime that you have more questions, quite frankly, you should be coming to see a specialist. So if you feel like your pediatrician is not able to uh, either take the time or is not able to really answer your questions about what this means for your child's future, that is where we can really come in because we have more resources available to us because this is what we do all day. Um, this is what we take care of on a daily basis. So we have a, a certified asthma educators and respiratory therapists and full pulmonary function testing lab. And we have all of these resources available to us in our office. Well, that certainly can help take away the worry, but is there a time when I get this diagnosis that I should worry. 
So um, the time to worry would be obviously if your child is having an asthma attack and so you are needing to go to the emergency room or you're getting admitted to the hospital frequently or you're making frequent urgent care visits or your child is being treated with frequent courses of oral steroids. So steroids, liquid steroids or uh, steroid pills that they need to take frequently because those are all medications that can have side effects in the long term. So if your child is presenting with any of those type of severe exacerbation or asthma attacks, that would be the time to worry and when you need to see a specialist in order to help you figure out how we can get this under better control. We are here to work with you to really help control your child's asthma so that you don't have to worry um, for the next time that an asthma attack does occur we would give you a plan so that you know exactly what to do in those steps, what steps to take to try to prevent it from getting to the point of needing to go to the emergency room or taking steroids again. Thank you. You know, I know as a mom myself, like knowledge is power. So if you know what to expect and, and what's what you should look for, that can really alleviate a lot of the concern. Exactly. So being a specialist can certainly assuage that worry. So what about allergies? If my child has allergies, should I see an allergist? Yes. Um, I, there are many reasons why you should see an allergist if you suspect that your child has allergies. Uh, one is we do skin testing. So when you come to the office, you will likely get tested. And I can tell you specifically what your child is allergic to, whether it's food or environmental, whatever the issue is. Once we know what the allergen is, then we can make better recommendations about avoidance uh, because that's the trigger for the symptoms usually. Um, the other reason is sometimes children are not optimized on their medication regimen and they're not doing well with their allergies. Right now we're in pollen season, so many kids are coming to us with seasonal allergies and they're just a mess because they're so symptomatic and we can optimize. I mean, it's not just over-the-counter medications that we can give, but we can prescribe things if we need to or put them on allergen immunotherapy, which is a longer treatment plan. And that's something we can discuss with them as well. Um, the other reason I would say specifically for the food allergy kids is that, you know, as trained board certified allergists, we know the natural history of specific food allergens. And so we can make better recommendations regarding when is your child likely going to outgrow these food allergies? When can we start talking about reintroducing the foods? Also lots of education, as Callie said, we, we pride ourselves here in the Pediatric Asthma and Allergy Center um, on education and, you know, teaching about, uh, management of anaphylaxis, you know, what is an EpiPen? Why do I need to carry an EpiPen? Um, ma asthma ma management, as Callie said. So, so there's lots of reasons to come to the allergist if you think your child has allergies. Thank you for that. So critical because not knowing is so frightening. You know, once you know, like we said, knowledge is power. It's once you know, you can be, you can be much more calm about it and help your child manage it better. Right. Thank you. So how important is family history when it comes to allergies and asthma? Is that a big component? So I, I, I we know that there is a strong genetic component to asthma and allergies. Um, we know that if both parents are allergic, there is a higher risk for the child to have an allergy. But one thing I will say, um, I do get a lot of parents who come in here and say to me, oh, you know, I have a shellfish allergy. Um, I'm worried that my child will have a shellfish allergy. The specific allergy does not get passed on. What gets passed on is the tendency or the predisposition to have some sort of allergic or atopic condition such as asthma or seasonal allergies or, or eczema, let's say. Um, the other thing I wanna say is uh, allergies, it's very, there's multiple variables involved. And so even though there's not a strong family history, we still find children who have allergies but don't have a genetic predisposition for it. There is a whole field now in research, it's called epigenetics, where it's not just genes that are important, we're finding that environmental exposures are also important. And so now researchers are looking at how specific genes interact with environmental exposures and how does that put a child at risk? So there's lots of variables. Um, yes, genetic predisposition is important, but it's not the only risk factor. Similarly, similarly with asthma. Um, so we do know that children whose families, uh, meaning their parents and their siblings in particular, have a history of asthma are much more likely to go on to develop asthma, especially in preschoolers if they have um, a history of recurrent episodes of wheezing. 
then uh, if there is a direct family history of asthma, that child has about a 75% likelihood of continuing to have asthma symptoms once they get to school age. So family history can definitely play a significant role, but it is not the only factor as Dr. Pramal mentioned. Um, environmental factors we know play also a significant role and several of them are things that we can really control. So secondhand smoke exposure is a big one. We know that secondhand smoke exposure can definitely increase a child's, a child's risk of having asthma, as well as exp um, exposure to certain allergens and particular um, environmental factors such as mice and roaches and other, uh, especially in New York City, something that we can really try to control with uh, pest avoidance measures and other allerg allergen mitigation measures that we can try to uh, put through. Which is another reason why coming to the allergist is important because then we can skin test and really know if you're allergic to these things and then give more guided uh, management plans. Exactly. Fantastic, thank you. I, that's Again, knowledge is power for sure. So Dr. Pamal talked a little bit about, just mentioned growing out of allergies. Can a child grow out of asthma? So yes, um, there are some children who do outgrow their asthma and asthma can change over time. Just like any other um, allergic type disease, there are, there are adjustments to uh, a child's sensitivity levels as they go, as they grow. So when a child has preschool wheezing or they have that, um, that uh, intermittent asthma or even persistent asthma as a toddler, um, there are certain risk factors that increase their chances of continuing to have persistent asthma as they get older. We already talked about family history, but a couple of other ones would be actually atopic dermatitis or eczema. So if the child has a history of ha having eczema, they are also much more likely to continue to have asthma symptoms and if they have um, allergic sensitization. So that's why allergies, asthma, and eczema tend to go together. And when they go together, that child is more likely to not outgrow their asthma as they get older. But I usually will tell parents that most kids will declare themselves around school age, around five or six years of old, at the of age is when we will be able to say, it sounds like your child is outgrowing their asthma or it sounds like your child is continuing to have some issues and will probably need to be on medication for at least a while longer. We also know that asthma is uh, significantly affected by hormone, uh, hormones. Um, and so there are oftentimes significant changes in a patient's asthma severity um, during puberty. Um, when they hit their 20s again, for women when they when they become pregnant, and then also when they when they hit menopause. So as they go through the different stages of life, a person's asthma can significantly change. Sometimes it gets better, sometimes it gets worse, and it's a little bit difficult to predict in each patient who is going to go in either direction. Which is why it's so important for people to for patients to follow up with their physicians on a regular basis so that we can make sure that you are heading in the right direction and that your asthma is staying well controlled. And along those lines, oh sorry, along those lines, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, something in allergy that we call the atopic march or the allergic march, where we have, you know, very often in my clinic, I'll have a little infant that comes in who has really bad eczema, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis or eczema along with food allergies. And over time, we see that most of these kids start to outgrow their eczema and they may outgrow some of their food allergies, which we can talk about a little bit later as well. But as they start to outgrow these two types of allergic conditions, what we see, as Callie said, is the beginning of seasonal allergies or environmental allergies and asthma. And if they stay on that trajectory, then those are gonna be your allergic children with asthma. Um, and so this is why it's important from even the beginning infancy stage to follow with a specialist, allergist or pulmonologist um, to follow these kids through time. Very interesting. Do, do you also find with allergies that hormonal changes affect them as well? Uh, they... there's, there's been some research on that. I think any ATP, whether it's asthma or food allergy or atopic dermatitis or allergic rhinitis, um, there is hormonal influence for sure. Great. So we do want to get back to talking about food allergies and outgrowing them because a lot of the times we hear that, but it can be very scary for a parent to introduce those foods. So what, what do you recommend? 
Great question. So if you've been formally diagnosed, if your child has been formally diagnosed by a physician, whether it's the pediatrician or the allergist with a food allergy, um, it is not a good idea to just introduce foods at home. Um, if you feel like your child might have outgrown it, it's always great, better to do this in consultation with an allergist. Um, we can skin test, we do specific IgE testing, which is blood work as well. And we make an educated decision about whether or not we believe your child has outgrown the food allergen. And if they have, we do in the office what's called an oral food challenge, where we will bring the child in and feed them the food in question, very small amounts every 15 to 20 minutes so that they've consumed over two hours certain gram of protein of that food. Because whenever you're allergic to food, you're allergic to the protein in that food. And if they've had, and then we observe them for another hour and a half, and if they've not had any reactions, then we can safely say at that point that you are no longer allergic. Uh, I would not recommend doing that at home because what if you have a reaction? We do it in an observed setting here. So we're ready to treat if we need to with Benadryl, Zyrtec, or epinephrine, but doing that at home can be very scary. And so for the viewers, anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening reaction that occurs when you eat a food that you're allergic to. Um, and it's, it's severe. That's why you carry EpiPens and you some, most of the time land in the hospital in the emergency room for this. Um, there are a few foods that we say you cannot grow. 85% of children will outgrow milk, egg, soy, and wheat. 20% will outgrow peanut, about 10% tree nuts. So knowing these statistics, we have a good idea of who might be the child who will outgrow these food allergens. And this is why on a longitudinal basis, we will repeat testing on an annual basis to see where they are with this. And similarly with asthma, the way that we decide whether a child is potentially outgrowing their asthma is by those recurrent visits back to the physician where we are able to perform tests such as uh, breathing tests or spirometry, also known as pulmonary function testing, which is very important for helping us to follow and track a child so that we can identify if there is any inflammation or airway tightening that we can't even hear on exam or that the parents are perhaps not really seeing signs of or symptoms of. Um, so we really are able to pick up those subtle changes in a child's health um, with our uh, testing and our visits. Is this typical um, procedure, like if, if I'm seeing an allergist or a pulmonologist, would it be typical procedure to retest and look to see if they're outgrowing it? Or is that something that as a parent, I should ask my specialist about? That's standard of practice uh, for both Callie and I. Yeah, we, we would do repeat testing longitudinally to see where things are. Okay. Yeah. And, and for anaphylaxis, is that something that children kind of can outgrow or grow into? Is that kind of like a moving target so as well? So the trigger, if we're talking food allergy, the trigger is a food allergen, right? So um, if you outgrow the food allergy, then you're no longer gonna have a risk for anaphylaxis. Now, with that being said, there are many other diagnoses in allergy that we take care of that has to do with anaphylaxis, but it's not uh, allergen related per se. So again, if your child has had a history of anaphylaxis, it's always a good idea to have it checked out by an allergist so that we can make a clear diagnosis. There are kids who have uh, food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. So they're not really allergic to foods, but they eat. And within four hours, if they're exercising, they will go into anaphylactic shock. Um, and so there's many, many, many uh, zebras out there. Yes. And so this is why it's great. It's better. It's better to see a trained allergist uh, to, to discuss these things. I think that's certainly the theme. You know, it's go see a specialist and find out exactly what it is going on with your child because everybody's different. Like you said, it could be a zebra, a unicorn. It can be, yeah. it can be something different. As many people as there are, there are different, different. There's, there's also one other thing that I forgot to bring up that comes up a lot in pediatrics. It's uh, drug allergies. So many children, when they're little, get placed on amoxicillin, uh, which is a common penicillin for ear infections and pneumonias. Um, and while they're sick, they break out in hives while they're on the amoxicillin, then they get labeled penicillin allergic. Oftentimes, it's not necessarily because of the drug allergy, although we're not certain, so we will say it's a penicillin allergy, it might be because of the virus, right? And so this is where the uh, allergist also comes into play because we have uh, standardized penicillin skin testing that we can do in the office 
and we can tell you whether or not your child is really allergic to penicillin because penicillin is a great antibiotic. It's a cheap antibiotic. Um, it's prescribed very often. And I think that's something that you would want to know. Now, along the lines of outgrowing it, about 80% of children who are diagnosed with a penicillin allergy early in life will outgrow that by adolescence. And so again, a good idea to come in and get your child rechecked um, if you think that they have a penicillin allergy or if they've been told they've had a penicillin allergy. You know, we had a question that just came up and it's just so perfect for right now, but Nicole wanted to know what is the timeline for retesting? Is it an annual thing, six months? You know, typically um, if there aren't significant changes. I think it depends on what we're talking about. If it's environmental allergies, I usually do that maybe every two to three years, unless if it's a really young child and we haven't picked up a lot, like a two-year-old or a three-year-old, oftentimes they don't come up very uh, very positive on testing because they're still little and they haven't had enough time to make antibodies, allergic antibodies, then maybe I'll repeat them in a year. Um, older kids, I'll do environmental every two to three years. Food, however, is a little bit different. So it depends on the food, right? So I told you that there are a few foods that you can outgrow quickly, milk, eggs, soy, and wheat, 85% do outgrow that. So those foods I definitely do on an on a, uh, annual basis. Um, peanut, tree nuts, shellfish, fish, I know most kids don't outgrow those foods, so I won't do that annually. I'll do that maybe every two to three years to see where we are with that. But it really depends on what we're talking about. And for children with asthma, we generally uh, recommend, the recommendation is for children with persistent asthma uh, or even intermittent asthma who uh, are well controlled, they should be having pulmonary function testing or spirometry at least every one to two years. Um, but if the child has moderate to severe persistent asthma, they should be having spirometry at every visit. So that can be every three months. Uh, if they're poorly controlled, it might be as often as every month mm. um, because that's really a, a very detailed tool that really helps us uh, see what specifically is going on inside that child's body. Terrific, thank you for that information. So in terms of treating seasonal allergies, you know, that's a hot topic right now, this time of year. <laughs> um, should, should one treat their child with over-the-counter medications and when should, they, should a parent consider prescription medication? So it's always a good idea, even for over-the-counter medications to do that in conjunction with the physician. So under the guidance of your pediatrician, um, it's fine to take over-the-counter uh, allergy medications. In fact, uh, many of our prescription allergy medications have now made their way over to uh, over-the-counter. So, so it's fine. Um, but if the over-the-counter stuff is not working, um, you're that severe and it's nothing's really helping, then that's when you should come to the allergist because there are other prescription uh, strength stuff that we can give um, that we have in our arsenal. And you might be the patient that we should discuss allergen immunotherapy with, which is the allergy shots that you get that could potentially cure or take away your allergies. Now, you know, all we do in allergy is treat to take away the symptoms. The only thing in my arsenal that I have that could potentially cure your seasonal allergies is allergen immunotherapy, but that is a uh, uh, time commitment. It's over three to five years of allergy shots and you'd have to be willing to come in once a month for them. They work well in the right patient. I will mention, however, that um, the over-the-counter allergy medicines, although excellent, really you need to make sure that you're taking the right medicines. So the over-the-counter allergy medicines known as the antihistamines are the ones that we will typically prescribe as well as the nasal steroid medications and nasal steroid sprays. Um, there are many, many medications out there that are known as cough suppressants. Um, so medications such as dextromethorphan, which actually have been shown multiple times to have very negative side effects in children and to actually have high risk of se serious side effects. So we recommend, especially for children with asthma, who oftentimes present with cough, parents should absolutely not be giving cough suppressants. If they have cough with their asthma, they need to be taking their asthma medications, their inhalers that are prescribed by physicians. And those medications can only be uh, written by prescription. They are not available over the counter. That's a very, very important distinction. I mean, I really think, you know, with these medications, it's best to see the doctor. And even if you're gonna use over the counter, make sure you're giving your child the right, the right medication. And the right dose. Oftentimes they come in and they're underdosed also. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Or overdosed the other way. 
So again, in conjunction with your pediatrician. Yes, your pediatrician can definitely help. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. So what about triggers? You know, we talked a little bit about the allergy triggers. What about what triggers should one avoid for your child's asthma? So it's important to be able to identify what it is that triggers your child's asthma. So there are multiple different things that can trigger an asthma attack, but also even just minor asthma symptoms that are just there all the time. So the biggest ones and the one that we normally will see as the number one trigger for asthma attacks are actually viruses or, Ill, uh, or colds. So this past year, we had the benefit of not seeing very many colds. So we actually had a very, very, very low incidence of asthma exacerbations over the past year and a half while everybody was cleaning their hands every day and wearing masks and socially distancing, which was a nice reprieve for those of us who took care of children with asthma. However, um, as schools reopen, as our children start interacting again, as we start getting around each other, what we've taken away from this past year and a half is just what a profound effect those basic infection control measures can really have on a child's asthma. So I would encourage your children to continue to make sure they are cleaning their hands. If your child has cold symptoms, keep them home from school. I know it's difficult, but it's really, really more difficult when we just keep passing viruses around the, uh, around the school. In addition, we strongly recommend uh, flu vaccination. Um, as the COVID vaccines become available, that's gonna be something else that's gonna be in our arsenal to really try to prevent children from obtaining these uh, significant viruses that can affect their asthma. The other major triggers for asthma attacks, of course, are allergies, which is why Dr. Pramal and I work so closely together <laughs> because that a, plays a significant role. So part of controlling a child's asthma in addition to asthma medications is really a matter of controlling their allergies. And that doesn't mean just with medication. That means also doing things like if they, once you identify what they are allergic to, trying to help them avoid those things that they are allergic to, which I'll let Dr. Pramal speak to a little bit more. But then the final trigger, the final types of triggers that we talk about are really irritants. So this would be things in the air. So things like secondhand smoke, vaping vapors. That's something that most people don't think about. They say, oh, vaping doesn't affect anybody else, but vaping produces a cloud as well. And that can be just as detrimental to a child as secondhand smoke. Um, in addition, strong odors, uh, cleaning um, products. So very heavy chlor uh, chlorinated pools. So for uh, sometimes that, that can be an issue. Although swimming is excellent for children with asthma, if there are high chlorine levels, that can oftentimes set off an asthma attack as well. So you really wanna try to make sure that you are decreasing any exposures or eliminating any exposures to those irritants as much as you possibly can. For instance, I never wear perfume because I would never wanna set off an asthma attack uh, in my patients. Um, and that is a joke that I have with my husband all the time but, uh, because he tries to buy me perfume and I say what am I going to do with this <laughs> I'm never going to wear it. Um, so those are little things that you have to think about I've had parents ask me about incense incense can be very irritating to a child with asthma because all of those irritants in the air and those smells in the air can really affect them Thank you. Thank you for that. All very important things for us to know about and certainly another good reason to quit smoking and vaping. Yes. So what about when child, as children are going, going to be going back to school, what, sh, what, do, what do parents need to do with asthma and allergies? Should they send the medications to the school nurse? How should they prepare the school to manage your, your child's allergies and asthma? So we have something in the asthma world and in the allergy world um, known as asthma action plans and food allergy action plans as well. Um, and the important part is just as you're communicating with your physicians, you need to be communicating with the school nurse. So if your child has asthma or has any kind of allergies, you need to be telling the school nurse what's going on. New York City schools have standardized forms for which medications your child can use at school. And so you would have your physician fill out the parts um, that they fill out as far as the medication dosing. So for asthma, it's typically some sort of a rescue inhaler like albuterol. 
There are some children who have it to use only as needed. So if they present with symptoms during school, so if they have coughing or wheezing or shortness of breath during school, they can go to the school nurse and the nurse can administer um, their asthma medication. Typically with a spacer, if there is an inhaler, which is very important. And oftentimes the schools require a new prescription for a, a separate inhaler and spacer for the school, which is very important to know. And the parents need to give their consent as well for the child to receive that medication. Some children also use that albuterol inhaler prior to exercise. And that's something that you'll decide along with your pediatrician or your physician uh, as to whether that's something that your child would need. And schools usually require these forms and the medications to be dropped off before the start of school. So we oftentimes will see that, you know, the summertime we're still busy, especially towards the end of summer, as everyone is needing those forms and those medications uh, filled out for school. Good. Good time to be thinking about it now. Dr. Pamal, do you want to do you want to add anything to that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for food allergy, as Callie said, uh, we also have a food allergy anaphylaxis management plan that we give out. Um, which specifies exactly what the food allergens are so the child avoids that during the day at school and also specifies what, what the nurse should do if the child by accident eats the food at school. And it's broken down by mild, moderate to severe anaphylactic reactions. And we give a prescription for EpiPens. We, give, you know, we tell them to have Benadryl on hand. Um, we do a lot of teaching on epinephrine auto injectors, how to give it, when to give it, um, and all of that is spelled out in the allergy anaphylaxis management plan. And so children always have to have that at school as well as the asthma action plan if they have asthma and they should always have at least one EpiPen on file for them along with Benadryl. And I'd so like to, to note also for older children um, because older children don't often go to the school nurse. We know they oftentimes will carry things on their own. They still, the school nurse still needs to be aware of what's going on. So there, uh, there is the opportunity on those action plans to uh, allow the child to self-carry and self-administer these medications if needed. Um, but the school nurse needs to be aware of these conditions so that, it, God forbid, something happens while they're at school, there is a medical professional around who is able to assist. And I, I saw a question in the chat asking about EpiPens if it's over the counter and just to like say, no, it's not over the counter. You need a prescription for that. Um, so another reason to tie in with an allergist. Uh, pediatricians can also prescribe that. Terrific, thank you so much. So, you know, we, we can't ignore COVID-19. So, you know, what has happened with COVID-19 now is that they're allowing the vaccinations now for children 12 and over. And there's a lot of talk about vaccinations now, even in the younger, younger grades um, starting in the fall. So if a child has asthma, should they get the COVID-19 vaccine? Absolutely. So we are currently recommending that all children down to the age of 12 um, have been approved for COVID vaccination. And we are recommending that all children receive the COVID vaccine, especially children with asthma. Um, we are not certain as to whether uh, COVID can be a significant trigger for asthma exacerbations, because this is a a new uh, disease really, and we haven't had as much COVID in the pediatric population as we have in the adult population. Um, however, um, we do know that viruses can trigger asthma exacerbations. And if we are able to prevent any sort of asthma exacerbations or long-term inflammatory effects from having had COVID um, in our asthma patients, then it is absolutely recommended that they re be receiving this vaccine. Thank you. And Dr. Ramal, what about children who have food allergies or a history of anaphylaxis? Is it safe for them to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Right. So having any history of immunodeficiency, food allergy, environmental allergy, venom allergy, latex allergy, those are not contraindications uh, to getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Even if you have a history of anaphylaxis, that is not a contraindication. You should get it. If you do have a history of having an anaphylactic reaction, uh, what we recommend is that you get the shot and you wait 30 minutes after receiving the shot. Um, the only contraindication that we're finding now, the CDC has reported in the allergy world, we're talking about this now, um, both the Moderna and the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines contain an ingredient uh, called polyethylene glycol. 
and polyethylene glycol can be found in some medications and other vaccinations. The derivative, a derivative of polyethylene glycol is uh, polysorbate 80, and that is also found in some vaccines and injectable medications. So if you have a history of anaphylaxing or having a severe allergic reaction to certain medications or vaccinations or injectable medications containing polyethylene glycol PEG, is the short word, um, or polysorbate 80, then I would then recommend that you consult with an allergist before receiving the vaccine. But there are no other contraindications that we know of at this time. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, this has been incredibly informative. I'm so appreciative. We have a lot of questions. I would love to be able to get to those questions now. So let me get started. Um, Zet said, I introduced my child to peanut butter, fish, wheat, bread, milk, and eggs from an early age. She's now three and a half years old and she's not had any reactions to date. Is it possible that she might become allergic to any of these foods or might even be allergic without evidence of a reaction? So... So great that you've introduced all these foods. You know, now the push in allergy is to introduce things early. There's lots of studies coming out showing that early introduction of foods, particularly peanut, um, is important in maintaining the early tolerance to these foods and to decrease the incidence of food allergy. So the fact that she's eating it is a great sign to maintain that tolerance. I would continue to feed her these foods so that her body keeps seeing it. Um, and even, and so, because she's eating it, um, that she's not allergic. I mean, there can't, you can't be allergic without having some evidence. Then the evidence would be hives, lip swelling, throat tightening, difficulty breathing, vomiting can be a sign of anaphylaxis. And those are usually immediate reactions. You see them within 15 minutes, usually 15 to 30 minutes, usually sooner. So I think you're on, you're on good footing. I don't think she has any allergies at this point, just from your story. And I think you're doing a great job. Terrific. Thank you so much. Judy said, what is your opinion on the allergy shot treatment for animal dander pollen for children with asthma? And how long does the shot take treatment take in general? So the uh, recent guidelines that just actually came out uh, in December of 2020 actually specifically address this and they discuss how children who are um, sensitized to certain allergens, whether it's animals or dust or pollens or things along those lines, um, who have poorly controlled asthma, that immunotherapy or allergy shots can actually decrease their sensitivity to their asthma as well. Um, and I'll let Dr. Pramal speak to how they work towards uh, the allergies. The caveat, the only caveat though, is if they have poorly controlled asthma, we would not start the allergy shots because it's uh, it's a risk, right? Um, what allergy shots are, it's a prescription that I would make containing all of the allergens that they're allergic to that we know from our skin testing. So these are extracts that are prepared in various dilutions of the things that you're allergic to in the environment. And we're giving you shots of these things. Okay. So the risk is always that you might have an allergic reaction, but we do it very safely. This is a tried and true therapy. It's been going on for years and years, and it's known to work. So you start off with very, very small dilutions, baby concentrations, and every week we up the dose, we up the dose, we see how you're doing until we get to a maintenance concentration. That takes about six months or so. These are all guesstimates though. Every, every individual is different. Once we get to the maintenance concentration, someone asked how long does it take? So it's monthly thereafter for about three to five years though. So it is a commitment. You have to be willing to come in monthly for at least three to five years. Um, the immediate effects, we don't see immediate effects. The earliest you might start to see some improvement in your allergies um, is about six months, but usually typically it takes about a year or so. Um, and then as time goes on, uh, you get better usually. Um, I saw another question if you wanted me to just hit that one now, since we're on the shot talk, the topic of allergy shots, um, does it work? Does it take your allergies away? And I will say, you know, I can't tell you 100% that it will work in everyone, but from what I've seen in my practice, and I've been doing this for a while now, there are three buckets. They're the ones who go on it and they do really well after stopping the shots, never to have allergies again. There's the other bucket where they go in, go on shots and they stop it after the three to five year course. And they might start to have a little bit of allergy symptoms, but nothing like what it was before. And then there's the group that unfortunately we stop it and they go back to having allergies. And we never know upfront who these patients are. Um, and the other thing I want to say in children, not in adults, because we see pediatrics in children, it's not usually the first thing that I'll do. 
uh, allergy shots, knowing that it is a commitment. We try medications first, but as a last resort, or if the allergies are that severe, then we will go on immunotherapy. And Great. the important and part from the, from the, I'm sorry, from the asthma perspective, the important part is because those allergies are such a significant trigger for patients with those allergic sensitizations, getting those allergies under control with the allergy shots is oftentimes what we are able to do to really get their asthma under control. So if the allergy medications are not enough, then something like immunotherapy can really take away those allergic triggers for them. And then their asthma, then we're able to come down on their asthma medications over time as well. Terrific. Another piece of that question is what will happen if the shot treatment is stopped halfway? Yeah, I just saw that. Um, so unfortunately, if you've stopped your allergy shots halfway um, and you decide that you want to start them again, you're going to have to start from the beginning for the exact same reason that I just said. We're giving you shots of things that you're allergic to. So we never want to give you full-blown dosing of the things you're allergic to. Giving you a shot of that could put you into anaphylaxis. So we have to do this in a stepwise fashion where we're building up. So my recommendation to anyone who thinks that they want to start allergy shots is if you're going to start it, you got to stay in for the long haul and go to the appointments and get it on a monthly basis like you should, because it becomes harder after that if you stop it. We know that a lot of folks missed their shots or were uh, unable to continue with shots, especially over the last year and a half. So chances are, if you are going back to starting shots again, you probably will need to decrease your dose again and work your way back up. Terrific. Another question on allergy shots. Nicole said, what age can we start allergy shots? My child is two years old today and was identified as having environmental allergies to tree pollen, oak, maple, birch, and pigweed. So two is on the younger side. I usually like to wait a bit until I have a good idea of what they're going to be allergic to, because as I had told you, a two-year-old may not be showing everything that they're allergic to. They're not young. They're, they're still young. They're not, they haven't developed enough allergic antibodies for us to pick up on skin testing. So the earliest for me, and the, you know, you talk to any allergist, they'll have different age cutoffs. For me is about seven to eight, um, because at that point, then I have a good idea. Okay. He's allergic to trees. Oh, he's also allergic to grass and ragweed and dust mites, you know? And the other thing is I, I typically don't put kids on allergy shots for one thing. Like if they're allergic to dust mites, I, I would not recommend doing allergy shots for dust mites alone. Um, it's usually the kid that has multiple sensitizations or multiple positive skin tests to allergens in the environment. And there's no allergy shots for food allergy. I get that a lot too. Allergy shots are only for environmental. Um, I would kill a child if I put them on allergy shots. And they tried doing this back in the day. They, they had studies looking at this and did not go so well. So, so there's only allergy shots for environmental allergens. Thank you for that distinction. Um, Barbara wanted to know, my 10-year-old asthmatic recently had a slight reaction to pistachios and hazelnuts on a recent panel and was given an EpiPen. Will this be reversed? And when they say reverse, I'm assuming they mean will it go away? So the question is, um, is this a real allergy? A lot of times uh, physicians will send off these panels and we'll get positive results back, but it means nothing clinically unless you take the clinical scenario into question. So I'm not sure if your child eats, has eaten pistachios or hazelnut. If they're eating it, that cannot be an allergy, okay? Because testing is not perfect. You can get false positives. Um, if it is a real allergy, uh, the statistic for tree nut, because those are tree nuts, 10% outgrow it. Mm, okay, thank you for that. Annabelle wanted to know, is there any long-term side effects for taking Flovent and I'm gonna, Monte Luke. Monte Luke, yes. Okay. <laughs> Got it, don't worry. Uh, my kids okay. don't have that. So, oh, no. so uh, uh, fluticasone Flovent is one of the inhaled steroids um, that we use for uh, asthma medications and asthma treatment. It's an inhaler. There are multiple different inhaled steroids that we do use. These are the mainstay of uh, asthma controller medications. So when a child has persistent asthma, um, we know that the biggest problem that they have is actually airway inflammation or redness and swelling, really that irritation down in their lungs. Um, the best medications we have for controlling that are the inhaled steroids. The inhaled steroids are, which usually come in inhalers, there's also nebulized forms, there's different kinds of inhalers, um, are very, very, very small doses of steroid that your child breathes in through that inhaler so that it only goes to their lungs. That means that the uh, amount of medicine or steroid that is absorbed into the body 
is minimal. It is very, very small amounts. So the primary um, side effects that we talk about from inhaled steroids would be a thrush or a yeast infection in the back of their mouth. So one thing that is recommended if your child is using an inhaler, a puffer, that they use a spacer, which is the uh, one-way valve holding chamber, which helps to uh, allow the child, so it traps the medicine in the chamber so your child can breathe in the medication slowly and actually get it into their lungs instead of it spraying out very quickly and sticking to the back of their mouth. The other thing that you need to do is after they use their inhaled steroid, you need to rinse their mouth out. So we usually suggest put their inhaler next to their toothbrush, have them use their medication because most of the medications are dosed twice a day anyway, have them use their medication and then brush their teeth and brush their tongue. The other long-term side effects that we do know can happen with inhaled steroids, particularly with children who are on medium to higher dose inhaled steroids on a daily basis. There is a slowdown in growth velocity. So how quickly their height goes up. There is a lot, especially over the first two years, but there is a lot of catch-up growth after that point so that the children do actually achieve almost their full growth potential. Now, long-term studies have shown that they can end up about a half an inch shorter than their projected height. Um, and that is only for children who remain on these medications very long-term for many, many years. However, the reason why we are willing to accept this, particularly for children with more persistent asthma, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe, is that the alternative treatment is for frequent exacerbations is that they will receive oral or systemic steroids, such as prednisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, which are medications that are taken in either liquid or um, pill form, go to the entire body, and we are known to have much more significant effects on growth, especially on height. Um, they can lead to obesity, they can lead to uh, diabetes, to high blood pressure, if they are taken more frequently than even two times a year. So what we really want to try to do is avoid those asthma attacks that are requiring the steroid courses over and over again by keeping the asthma under control with these tiny, tiny doses of inhaled steroids that are really only going to their lungs. Sure, thank you for that. You know, I just want a clarification because Nicole was asking, you know, uh, why are we brushing after an inhaled dose? Is it dangerous? So can you just quickly Tell it's us not that it's off. it's not that it's dangerous. So what happens is with an inhaler, the medication comes out very very quickly, and so it's very difficult for anyone to coordinate breathing in and puffing at the same time. So the spacer traps the medicine in there, so you actually breathe it in. So when the medicine comes out very quickly, if you're putting the inhaler directly into your mouth, that in a inhaled steroid, um, 80% of it can get deposited on the back of the throat or on the tongue. And so then having steroids constantly going onto the back of the tongue and the throat can lead to that yeast infection or that, th that thrush in the back of the mouth. So that's why we need to rinse the mouth. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Taniqua said, my daughter has allergies and asthma and is 11 years old. She can't get the shot now. What's your recommended health approach for her going back to school in September? That's a great question. <laughs> and we're hearing that all the time. So my recommendation is, and my recommendation through all of this has been that um, having asthma is not a contraindication to kids going to school. Um, I would recommend that they continue with their infection control practices. So wearing their masks, socially distancing, cleaning their hands. And when they are eligible for the vaccine, she can go and get the vaccine. But up until then, she should absolutely be continuing with the same sort of um, uh, infection control practices that we've been undergoing the last year and a half. Terrific. And also to see a specialist if you haven't, I did put um, information here that if you want to make an appointment at New York Presbyterian Queens, uh, I provided the phone number 718-670-1920. And 
The website is uh, nyp.org slash queens. Um, so you can go there and, and make your appointment. Um, in terms of exercise is a question is, my child has exercise induced asthma. Does this mean they can't participate in sports? Absolutely not. <laughs> so yeah. there are Olympic athletes who have asthma. And I tell all of my patients this. Um, asthma that uh, is well controlled, your child should be able to do everything that they want to do. Um, so if your child is having symptoms with exercise, you will work with your physician to come up with a plan. Most children who have exercise induced asthma use a bronchodilator, something like albuterol prior to exercise, 15 minutes prior to exercise. And what that does is it just opens up their lungs, makes it easier for them to breathe and participate in the sports that they wanna participate in. If your child is still having symptoms of difficulty breathing, coughing or wheezing with exercise, even with pre-exercise albuterol, that suggests that their asthma is not well controlled and you need to be speaking with your physician or your asthma specialist about what other medications you can consider using. Terrific. Um, I have a question on allergies. Uh, Sheena wanted to know, are there any natural foods that can prevent seasonal allergies? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of media on bee pollens and bee honey. Um, I think it doesn't hurt, but there's no medical scientific research uh, to support this. Um, so my answer as an allergist immunologist is probably no, but I'm always for the natural stuff. My one caveat to that, because there have been multiple patients who have asked me about that from an asthma perspective as well, is that if you do it in conjunction with the therapies recommended with your physician, I think that it's usually okay. However, you do need to be careful because if your child has a number of allergies, you might not necessarily know what is in that alternative therapy or homeopathic therapy that you are giving your child because many of these are not FDA approved. And so the complete ingredient list may not be there. So there is the possibility that your child could have an allergic reaction to one of those remedies that you are giving. So you need to really try to do it in conjunction with your physician and make sure that they are continuing their other asthma and allergy medications as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Make sure you make let your physicians know exactly what your child is taking so they can make the right recommendation. Dr. Pramal, were you going to say something? I was going to say, I thought it was foods that they were wanting to introduce, but if they're talking about uh, homeopathic kind of stuff, that's a different category altogether. So yes, I agree okay. with you. Terrific. Um, just a couple more quick questions. People are, have so many wonderful questions. Um, Judy wants to know, do you still recommend the spacer for a high school teen or is a spacer just for young children? We recommend spacers for adults as well. Yeah. <laughs> the You'd be surprised how, yes. how any kind of inhaler, yeah, the, the puffer inhalers, the medication comes out very quickly. Even adults cannot coordinate that deep breath in and the, uh, uh, the actuation of the inhalers. So we recommend spacers for adults, teenage children, and young children. And infants down to six months of age can use a spacer with an inhaler. Terrific, thank you. And Carla wants to know, what is the difference between salvage Salbutamol and albuterol. Salbutamol. Nothing. Salbutamol is the uh, bronchodilator that is used in uh, Europe and in uh, South America. Albuterol is the bronchodilator that we use in the United States. Terrific. Terrific. So before we say goodbye, because I want to respect your time, we could be here all day asking these questions and we really appreciate your, your um, generosity with your time. Maybe each one of you can just quickly share with us, you know, what is the, the, the secret tip or the, or the most important thing that you would give to maybe like a family member, close friends about dealing with your child with asthma and allergies? What would that be? I would say find an allergist that you are comfortable with and follow with them very closely um, because, you know, as we, I hope we've gotten out of this is that um, it is sometimes a lifelong thing. Sometimes they outgrow it. It's just the close follow-up that we need. 
Um, and, and it's the whole unit because it affects everyone. It doesn't just affect, you know, I, the parents that come in with the infants, specifically with food allergy, it's very devastating for them. And I can, I know this as a mother myself, not to be able to feed your child a food and then worry that they're going to have an anaphylactic reaction, you know? So I, I, I think really finding a physician or a provider that you feel comfortable with, um, that can sort of become like family to you, you know, um, and that you can follow with through time. And the beauty of pediatrics, and this is why I love pediatrics, is that we can follow these children through the lifespan, you know, until they get up into their 20, 20, 21. I don't know how, what the latest, the, old, the oldest that we can see is, but, but it's beautiful to follow the child and the family through time. So that would be my recommendation as a mom also. Wonderful. And I and I would echo that as well, really developing that relationship and an open relationship and an honest relationship with your physician, whether it's your pediatrician or your specialist who's really helping to take care of your child's asthma and allergies is incredibly important because we can't wait. Unfortunately, we can't wave a magic wand to make these things go away. The only way that we're able to really help you, because that's how we want to do this, is we want to be making these decisions together to help uh, you um, work your child's management plan into your daily lives, because we understand that this affects your daily lives. And unless you tell us exactly what's going on, what is working, what is not working, what other things you're considering, what your fears are, what your questions are, we're not really able to help you and to understand what we can do to help your child live their lives the way that you want them to live them and the way that they want to live them, which is really the ultimate um, goal in pediatrics always is to help children to be the best that they can be. And so we can do that together by uh, really working together, families and providers together to, to make that plan for the children. Fantastic. What a wonderful way to end the webinar. Dr. Trilakis and Dr. Pramal, thank you so, so, so much for providing all this information to us. As I shared um, in the chat is contact information. I'll also be sending out an email tomorrow with contact information. You'll also get a link to this recorded video so you can watch it again, share it with friends and family. And we also have a little surprise for you with the behind the scenes with our doctors. Uh, they share their why about why they went into this field um, of medicine. So you can catch that too. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I wish you all a wonderful day, a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.